uh, can you give a brief history of the SpaceX rocket engines that were uh, used that we haven't covered? So you mentioned it all started with a Merlin engine and a Kestrel engine. What, um, yeah, for, through that, that lens, yeah, what's, what's there? The engines are relatively small number, which is which is easy for us. There's yeah, the Merlin and Merlin's evolved throughout time to be from like the Merlin to the Merlin 1C to the Merlin 1D to the Merlin 1D full thrust and all these other kind of tweaks of the same architecture. Uh, Kestrel ended with Falcon 1. Um, they also have the Merlin vacuum engine, which is the upper stage engine for Falcon 9. Same relative uh, system, but just optimized for vacuum. So it has a much larger bell nozzle. There's the Draco thrusters, which, you know, you kind of can consider engines. Well, they are rocket engines, but they're just small. They're not like the orbital engines. There's the Super Draco engines, which are the abort thrusters on on Crew Dragon capsule. And then nowadays they have the Raptor engine and the Raptor vacuum variant. Um, but they've already had two versions of Raptor. We've already seen kind of the Raptor development engine. Um, we've kind of seen like a Raptor 1.5, where it's kind of taking hints of the future Raptor. But now we're well within the well within what you know you'd consider a Raptor 2 variant. And, and that's the, really it. Yeah, for the uh, the Raptor. Maybe I'll ask you that separately, but I like in general, and people, who doesn't know who Everyday Astronaut is, but if you don't somehow know, go, go, go check his, uh, your YouTube channel out. You're an incredible educator about the, the super technical and uh, the more sort of, even the, the philosophical, the actual, like the, the actual space travel. So you go down to the raw details of it and there's just great videos on the Raptor engine. Um, I think you have one on Merlin, uh, and and also actual tours with Elon where he discusses some of those things. On one of the tours, he says uh, he's full of good lines. That guy, <laughs> uh, he, he says something about uh, the number of fiddly bits, <laughs> and he's uh, the, the number of fiddly bits was decreased between Raptor two and Raptor one. Yeah, and I, I think that's actually a really beautiful representation of um, the engineering efforts there, which is constantly trying to simplify. Oh, yeah. uh, increase the efficiency of the engines, but also uh, simplify the design so you can manufacture it. And in general, simplification leads to better performance and testing, you know, and everything. So the number of fiddly bits, I'm sure there's a Wikipedia page on that now <laughs> as an index is a, actually a really good one. Well, and when you think about it, I, I don't know of any other company prior that had kind of try to measure their performance of their engine, not in like thrust to weight ratio or like how efficient it is, like in specific impulse, but literally in like dollar to thrust ratio. Like how much does this engine cost? Yeah. How much thrust can it produce? And like using that as a trade study instead of just like pure metrics of, you know, cause at the end of the day, like, okay, if it's, if it's cheaper and does, you know, X amount of work, even if it's less efficient, it can actually be better long-term. And so I, I guess another way, it's not even just thrust, I don't know if that metric is used, but basically the cost of getting one kilogram of thing up into space. Yeah. That's basically what they're trying to minimize. Especially, right? yeah. Like, at, so, the, the, at the end of the day, that is definitely the ultimate metric is how much does one kilogram cost to orbit eventually, you know? And, and But there's, it's so funny because spaceflight is just the ultimate, you know, it's the ultimate compromise. Every little thing, any variable can just change everything else. So you can tweak so many different things to get to different numbers and conclusions, you know, but even things like on your first stage, when you're, when you're, the rocket's pointing straight up and the engines are pointing straight down, you're dealing more with the thrust to weight ratio of the rocket. So how much thrust is it producing versus how much is gravity pulling down on it is actually a more important metric than how raw efficient the engine is. So it's funny. And then in space, it's kind of the opposite. Thrust to weight ratio doesn't really matter. Uh, what really matters is the actual, the specific impulse, it's called, or like the, the nozzle escape velocity of the, or the, Injection velocity of the how fast is the, the gas moving is like the more important number <laughs> on orbit, but it's it's just so crazy because there's all these like I would just love to see the trade studies, you know, when you're like trying to figure out like is this more important than this or this or this, and it's like you change this one little thing, and all of a sudden, you know, like all the everything changes. It's just even the profile, like the, the launch profile, the trajectory of it, the I mean, everything. <laughs> Everything. I, I wonder what that trade out discussions are, are like, because you can't really perfectly plan everything. So, and you always have to have some spare leleway, on, 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 you know, especially as you're testing new vehicles like yeah. Starship. Yeah. So margins are important. Yeah, having having a margin given all the uncertainty that's there. Yeah, it's really interesting, like how they do those kinds of trade outs, because they're also rapidly designing and redesigning and re engineering 
and uh, the ultimately you want to give yourself the freedom to constantly innovate, but then through the process of testing, you solidify the thing that can be relied upon, especially if it's a crude mission. Yeah. That, yeah. that uh, how to do that in a rapid cycle. I, I remember at some point that NASA, as they're leading up to flying humans for the first time for NASA, um, you know, there's some talk that like, we're going to do a design freeze because SpaceX does evolve and iterate so quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, they were saying that it was leading, because especially at the time, it was a, a mission called Amos 6, and it, uh, they lost a rocket. They've only lost two rockets, like, ever, really, as far as, um, you know, trying to get something to space. Uh, it, for, for the Falcon 9, sorry. Um, and the second one, Amos 6, I mean, that was back in 2016, so it's it's been a long time. And uh, But at the time, you know, they were looking at flying humans in the near future, and it's like, if you guys keep tweaking this thing every time you take it out to the pad, well, there's going to be a problem, you know? And so there is some pressure from NASA to kind of slow down on that iterative process. And, uh, but that is also why they were able to evolve the Falcon 9 to be what it is today is because they did just evolve it so quickly. Literally like one after another was never really the same. And we're definitely seeing that with Starship now. Like it's <laughs> evolved so quickly that you just can't even keep up with it, you know?